This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. Welcome. I'm Alan Bassbaum. I'm, uh, I'm the chair of the Department of Anatomy here at UCSF. I'm going to begin by asking, because um, I used to run Minimet in another century, literally. Uh, and I'm curious how many, and I've given a pain lecture uh, in the past, and I'm curious whether any of you happen to have been to a previous one years ago. A handful. OK, so you might recognize a few slides. I've Trying to bring it up to date, so I promise you we've learned a little bit since I last lectured. Uh, some of the things um, will seem familiar, but hopefully I'll put it into a slightly different context to the best I can. Um, now, I, under normal circumstances, one would have begun the whole series on pain with the science of pain. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, unfortunately, I was asked a little bit uh, late, and I just couldn't do it. So I said, yeah, I'm happy to do it after. And so I actually went over all the slides that you have seen already. And so a few words will be familiar, which is great. But my goal here is to teach you a little bit about uh, what causes pain, the different types of pain, um, the varieties of ways to treat pain, which is much more interesting. I'm going to end. I'm going to end. I'm going to end with. Um, really a look to the future, some very, what I would consider, uh, cutting edge type work uh, that gives a very different perspective on a ways to treat pain. It's not gonna happen tomorrow uh, or next year, but it really, um, we're excited about it and I thought it would be kind of interesting to, to let you know what's happening. So it's worth beginning with the definition of pain, or at least the definition I accept. Now, I happen to be the editor-in-chief of Pain, which is the journal of the International Association for the Study of Pain. And they have a rather, conv what I consider, a convoluted definition. Um, the important thing is it says, pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. That's the most important part, is that it's, there's a sensory and an emotional component to it. If there's no emotions, as far as I'm concerned, it's not pain. And there are people who have no emotional uh, response uh, with, to a, what you would think is a painful stimulus. They can say, yeah, it, it's very intense, it's very hot, doesn't bother me. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, there's no pain. So that part of the definition is easy to understand. Associated with actual or potential tissue damage, obviously actual tissue damage can produce pain, but very often we see something happen and we think there's going to be we assume there's going to be pain because we expect and we usually associate pain with tissue damage. Um, but it's this part that is the most important. A rather simpler way to think of it is, say, in other words, pain is not a stimulus. And that's one of the hardest things to accept. It is not a stimulus. Pain is an experience. It is a perception of the brain. And that's why two different people with the same stimulus will experience two different types of pain under normal circumstances. Uh, yes, if I stuck you with a pin, it'll hurt everybody, but if you were delivering a baby uh, and you wanted the baby versus someone who, you don't know who the father is, uh, you're not, you're, you, you, you didn't want to get pregnant, uh, your experience is going to be different. Somebody who had Lamaze, right, where you, they teach you how to breathe, my wife did this, uh, they teach you how to breathe. You've been breathing all your life, but you, they teach you how to breathe, and you 
learn distraction, you understand the birth process, you're looking forward to it. Now, in the woman in the next bed, no Lamaze, doesn't really want the baby. Basically the same physical stimulus, but a very different experience. So pain is not a stimulus, it's a perception. And that's what we're going to try to explain, or I'm going to try to explain, as to where this transition from the stimulus to the perception actually occurs. And then it has three major features. There's a sensory component. You can tell where the pain is. It's in your left arm, it's in your right leg, it's in your face. But it is, has an emotional or affective, affective or emotional component, we already said that. And it's cognitive, it depends on the context in which you experience it. We always hear about the football players who, who broke their leg and they didn't know till the game was over, soldiers who were injured on the battlefield and they didn't report pain until they got back to the hospital because the situation uh, did, was one that didn't really call, to ex call for experiencing pain. This is a slide I like to show, it occurred in San Francisco, and it illustrates really the problem of chronic pain, and in some respects the problem of the, the medical approach to pain. It's getting better, but it's not perfect. This is an individual, a gentleman, who was dying of cancer and had severe pain. Unfortunately, the two often go together. And was sent home, in a, not a hospice situation, but sent home with the understanding that he was going to die. Uh, and the physician gave this individual, this gentleman, uh, my recollection was Tylenol codeine, and which did almost nothing for his pain. Uh, and he kept complaining, had terrible pains. No, believe it or not, they didn't want to give more pain because they were afraid, the physician was afraid this gentleman would get addicted. <laughs> we'll talk about that later, but even the notion that you would even be concerned of somebody who's, who's dying and you're gonna withhold drugs. Uh, but the fact is, this is an individual who should have been given as much drug as was necessary to get rid of their pain. Anyway, the family sued after the, 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 the individual died and they actually won a lot of money. That's not the point. The point was that somebody was guessing how much pain the patient had, which is the biggest mistake. The first thing I teach medical students is you never know how much pain the patient has. You listen to the patient and your goal is to get rid of their pain. If you think they're malingerers, then you better find another physician to deal with the problem because you're gonna under-medicate them and you've got to listen, and your job is to get rid of their pain as best you can. So, acute pain is not a problem. We'll talk about the mechanisms of generating acute pain, but the real uh, big problem, of course, is clinical pain, chronic, persistent, ongoing pain. And there are two major types. The first is what we call nociceptive pain, or pain associated with tissue injury. We've all experienced that, has inflammation. Uh, you have the typical aches and sprains, or when you get older and you wake up in the morning and you're sore, uh, these are the types of tissue injury pains. Usually uh, there's inflammation. Arthritis is the most common uh, cause of this. Cancer pain, uh, an element of it is going to be tissue injury or nociceptive, what we call nociceptive pain. Uh, because the tumor is gonna invade normal tissue and it's gonna activate nerve fibers and produce that type of pain. Uh, headache is a classic example. I don't have time to get into it. Migraine is a unique uh, example of that, and we might, in questions, talk a little bit about, about migraine. So this is probably the most common type of pain. What's interesting about this particular pain is that, yes, there's pain, but the big problem is that this is a condition in which innocuous stimuli hurt, so that it hurts to move. That's not normal, that's abnormal, but that's an example of what you need to deal with. That's actually the major problem, and we'll talk about treating what is called allodynia, or namely pain provoked by stimuli that are normally not painful. This is a terrible example of an individual with a severe arthritic condition, and of course the joints are distorted and the patient isn't happy about that, but they will tell you the biggest problem is not that the joints are distorted, it's that it hurts to move their fingers. They can't tie their shoelaces. If you could treat that, they would be much happier and they could tolerate the joint disruption. That's what ruins people's lives is the fact that normal daily activities are now painful. That's what you have to treat in this condition. Now, the simple way of thinking about this type of problem is illustrated in a nice diagram that was generated by a colleague of mine, Fernando Cervero, who's now in Montreal. 
It's really an artificial type diagram, but let's look at it. And all that's being plotted here is pain on the y-axis, and interestingly, it goes from zero to 100, which is a typical pain scale, and you heard about this previously. It's the standard scale that a pa any patient in the hospital now by law is asked to assess. So you take blood pressure, pulse, et cetera, respiratory rate, and by law, you must ask the patient how much pain you have, on, say, on a zero to 100 scale, and that's valuable. I mean, your 70 is not the same as your 70, so if you tell me you have 70 out of 100, that's fine. I, it, that doesn't tell me anything about how much pain you have. It's probably a lot. But if I come back the next day and I gave you an, a, a, a drug to treat your pain and you said it's now 30 and you said it's 60, then I know that I did something much better for you than you. So within an individual, that's a very meaningful number. So here's a case, somewhere zero to 100, and when a stimulus enters what we call the noxious range, that's the point at which if, I, if it continues, it would actually produce tissue injury you get kind of a dose response curve for pain. As the stimulus gets more and more intense, could be a heat stimulus or a chemical stimulus, you get more and more pain. That's normal acute pain, everybody has that. What's more interesting or what's more relevant to the clinical condition is when in the setting, in this case, insult or injury, the dose response curve for pain shifts to the left, such that stimuli that are now innocuous, light touch to a person with sunburn, for example, in the simplest case, is now painful, and we call that allodynia. And in the worst case, you use a painful stimulus, and we call it hyperalgesia, you get exacerbated or excess, increased pain to the painful stimulus. This is not a clinical problem, because people with pain problems don't go seeking painful stimuli, but they can't avoid these stimuli. So this is the clinical problem that you deal with. Ongoing pain and, if you will, hypersensitivity. Now, the other major class of clinical pains, which used to be considered kind of an orphan disease, and people now realize it is huge, uh, and the real reason, one of the reasons, is because of the, the, the rampant problem of diabetes, uh, and there are nerve damages associated, peripheral nerve damage associated with diabetes because they're vascular changes, and that nerve damage produces what's called neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain are pains associated with frank nerve damage, usually in the peripheral nerves of your arms and your legs, could have come about also from damage in the central nervous system, uh, say in multiple sclerosis, post-stroke, spinal cord injury, but the ones that we might talk, we'll talk a little about today, are the peripheral nerve pains. Um, post herpetic neuralgia, I'll show you an example of that. Quite a common problem, everyone knows about herpes zoster, shingles, uh, it comes from the herpes zoster virus, and you get a breakout, usually in the uh, upper forehead, the first division of your trigeminal nerve, or in a, in a part of your chest. Um, it's painful when you have the shingles outbreak, but after six weeks, it usually clears up. In about 20% of patients, you can be left with a severe pain problem. I'll show you an example. Uh, phantom limb pain is the more extreme example. Everyone knows that if you lose a limb, you develop a phantom, right? You have a phantom, your limb is there, you can move it, it seems totally normal, and it's because the representation of that limb is still in your brain. And as long as that's there, you're gonna think you have, a, have an arm. Yes? Does idiopathic uh, occupy a large percentage of this? <coughs> well, idiopathic to the extent that we don't know what causes it. If there's frank nerve damage that you can demonstrate, the answer is yes. That would be a neuropathic pain. But is, is, is idiopathic a large percentage of neuropathic pain? No, I wouldn't think so, no. Um, unfortunately, in about maybe 20% of people with phantom limbs, they have phantom limb pain, where the limb is in a clenched position. They'll tell you the nails of my phantom are digging into my hand. It's excruciating, do something. It's an extremely difficult pain to treat. That's a neuropathic pain, a rather extreme example, all right? But these are, all, these are very common. Reflex sympathetic dystrophy, or what's called complex regional pain syndrome, is uh, also associated with these conditions, and in addition, you get spontaneous pains. This is one example, an old picture from a famous textbook from uh, one of the godfathers of the pain field, John Benica. This is an individual with what we call 
reflex sympathetic dystrophy, or now complex regional pain syndrome, CRIPS. You can tell there's a difference between the two arms. There was a mild nerve injury, sometimes almost undetectable. This, this arm has ongoing burning pain all the time. Light touch is excruciating. Movement can be excruciating. Warm temperatures, excruciating. There's, you can see, abnormal hair growth. If there's swelling, there's a lot of things going on from this minor nerve damage, and it's associated with terrible pains. If you do a thermogram to measure temperature, you can see that that hand is ice cold. Even though it's burning, it's, it's blue in the thermogram, it's ice cold, okay? So there are massive abnormalities as a, cause, as a result of that nerve injury, and you're left with ongoing burning pain and incredible hypersensitivity. And this is a woman with postherpetic neuralgia of what we call the first division of the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal nerve innervates the entire face, and then one of the branches innervates the forehead. And this woman, the virus has entered cell bodies that have uh, destroyed some nerves, and you can see it's on one side of the face down to the eye. There's been the record, the, this is the rash that existed from the, the, the initial outbreak. That resolved or is resolving, and then this woman unfortunately is left with postherpetic neuralgia. Literally the lightest touch or the air in the room will produce excruciating pain and there's ongoing pain. Very difficult to treat, does not respond very well to morphine or to aspirin-like drugs. You need a totally different approach to treating this, which is very different from the nociceptive or inflammatory pains, which we all have and which we use over-the-counter drugs that work or, if necessary, narcotics. And we'll talk about how those work uh, later in the talk. Fortunately, although we can't treat all pains, we can treat most of them, uh, and there's lots and lots of drugs and lots and lots of ways, and my intent is to try to cover as many as I can in the time that I have. Among the things I do want to talk about are aspirin, and other so-called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the NSAIDs, that everybody here has had. It's one of the simplest things to explain, very effective drugs, Can't, doesn't solve all problems, but obviously we take them because they work. Morphine and other opioids, we'll talk about that. The narcotics, unfortunately, if you will, are the drug of choice for severe pain. It's the best thing there is. We'll talk about whether that's good uh, is there anything better? Cannabinoids, marijuana. You read about it in the news, so I don't want to ignore it, and we'll talk a little bit about whether that's in fact any good for pain. Brain stimulation, I'm gonna introduce it as a segue into how narcotics and morphine works. It's not something that is very common anymore, but it's a very useful uh, a way to explain uh, uh, how opiates work to block pain. Placebos. How many people here think that if you respond to a placebo, therefore you probably don't have pain? <laughs> Nobody, that's good. Because the fact is, the more pain you have, the more likely you are to be a placebo responder. All right, and we'll talk about how placebos might work because they work. They're very effective. Not that anybody should be giving you a placebo intentionally, but they work. Acupuncture, we'll talk about it to the extent that I can. And what I consider extremely underutilized way of treating pain, namely hypnosis, and we'll get there hopefully at the end. So let's begin at the beginning. And I like to show this. My wife tells me, when are you gonna stop showing this slide? And I say, well, Descartes's been dead for a long time, so I can keep showing it. He actually wrote about pain even though that's obviously not what he studied, but he was interested in perceptions, and he did write about pain. I, as I've done previously, we'll bring it, make it a little more modern. Uh, and basically what Descartes said, he didn't know anything about nerves, he didn't know anything about synapses, but he postulated that when you burn the foot, B, it was all in French, of course, information travels up the leg, the spinal cord, and then goes to the brain in some pain center. It was very simple, it was a classic telephone line. Somewhat disappointingly, that's what we teach the medical students at most universities, of course not here. Uh, the textbooks really look what they teach, like the Cartesian view of pain. Doesn't it look, well, 
there. It looks just like <laughs> the Cartesian view. You have, now we have peripheral nerves. They respond to the stimulus, the painful stimulus. They have a cell body here, we'll talk about that. The information goes into the spinal cord, there's a synapse, and then travels up to the brain, and you get pain, just like Descartes. Well, if this was how pain is generated, and you could account for all pains, how would you treat pain? Guaranteed to work every time. Cut it, yeah, cut. <laughs> cut it. There, nothing goes to the brain, this patient's all better. Right? Well, the fact is neurosurgeons have been doing that for years and they continue to. I'm not saying it doesn't ever work, it does work. Unfortunately, unless you cut the whole spinal cord, the pain often comes back. So they've cut in peripheral nerves, they'll cut near the spinal cord, they'll split the spinal cord down the middle, they'll even do frontal lobotomies. It's all the same pathway, supposedly, so why should you have to go here when you, can, you should be able to eliminate the problem down here? Makes you wonder. It suggests to me that there is no such thing as pain transmission. There is transmission of injury inputs, messages to the brain, and then the brain interprets it. And as I said before, you may get pain, you may not get pain. You may get a lot of pain, you may get a little pain. If you want the baby, if you're not so happy about it, you just won the football championship, you didn't realize that you, that you broke your leg. Conditions make a difference because there's, as we'll see, there's a brain attached to this, this injury. The analogy I like to draw, and I, I, I think it's a wonderful one in this audience, because uh, we'll understand what I'm talking about, the new medical students have no idea what I'm talking about, is, remember a telephone? Yes. And, <laughs> with a wire attached to it? Well, if you cut the wire, it doesn't work. Right? You tell that to the new medical students and they don't know what you're talking about. This year. <laughs> no, what wire, what wire? Anyway, the point is, this is not a telephone wire because if, we, if it were, we could just cut it and solve the problem. So we can't solve the problem that way, so we need to uh, learn a little bit more about where the pathway breaks down. How does pain get generated in response to injury? What happens as the information transits into the spinal cord, up to the brain, uh, and then gets interpreted. And that's what I want to do, is take you on this little trip. So by beginning about the anatomy of pain, I said that I am an anatomist, I'm chair of the anatomy department, and it's what I do is I study circuits. So this is a big blow up of the spinal cord. Here's a foot, and there's a peripheral nerve fiber. It has a cell body, it's a garden variety nerve fiber with a cell body, and a branch that goes into the spinal cord. So when you get an injury here, or if I pinch it or you step on a nail or something, you activate nerve fibers and they get information to the spinal cord and they go to the brain. Now, if we were to look at that peripheral nerve, we would find that that peripheral nerve contains a variety of nerve fibers. So let's look at a cross section of this nerve. And it looks like this, schematically. There's myelinated fibers. The myelin, these are big fibers that have a lipid sheath around them so that they conduct very, very rapidly. These are the ones that respond to light touch or some of them actually control muscles. So they have to go respond quickly. They conduct very, very rapidly. They do not respond to painful stimulation. You have small myelinated fibers. They conduct not as fast as the big guys and they do respond to painful stimuli. Tend to be sharp, acute stimuli, like a pinprick like a pinch. And then you have this massive number of what we call unmyelinated fibers. They conduct very slowly, but the vast majority of them are the ones that are actually generating the pain message. Now, it is the unmyelinated and the small myelinated fibers, they're the only ones that respond to a painful, what we call a noxious stimulus. Noxious meaning gonna produce tissue injury. Whether it's mechanical noxious, chemical noxious, heat noxious, Ice cold noxious, those are the fibers that respond. So it sounds very simple. We've got, we just modified Descartes a little bit. Well, it's more complicated than that. And this is where the last few years have absolutely dramatically changed our view of how pain is transmitted in the periphery. And that's because we know that these nerve fibers are amazingly heterogeneous. 
And I wouldn't tell you about this if I didn't think it was relevant. And let me just give you an example. This is a better way to think of, of looking at, say, an unmyelinated, slowly conducting, if you will, in quotations, pain fiber, because remember, pain's in the brain. So here I'd simplified it, taken a diagram from some friends of mine. Here's that cell body, the axone, the nerve fiber goes into the spinal cord and eventually the information goes to the brain. What we find is they are molecularly heterogeneous. There are classes of receptors, targets, channels that respond to an array of different stimuli. And the most famous one was a receptor called TRPV1. The names aren't important. It's a member of a big family of so-called TRP channels. But what's interesting about this one, this is a heat channel. Painful heat excites this channel. It is also responsive, interestingly, to capsaicin. What is capsaicin? The allergogenic pain-producing substance in hot peppers. When you go to a spicy restaurant and eat spicy food, you are activating TRPV1, in that case in your tongue, and it burns. But it also is the heat channel. So there are temperature-sensitive heat channels. There are acid sensing channels. Why is, acid, acid, why is an acid sensing channel, that's a tough one, a uh, of interest? Because when you have inflammation, you have breakdown of tissue, and the pH drops. In other words, the area of the inflammation is acidic. If it's acidic and there are acid sensing channels, they are going to activate the nociceptor, what we call the pain fiber, the nociceptor, and it's going to send information to the brain. The holy grail are the mechanosensitive mechano channels, and we know some of them, but not all. Why is this important? If you remember what I said, the biggest problem that patients have, say with arthritis, is that it hurts when you move. Now, if you, if you say, Doc, it hurts when I take a warm bath. Don't take a warm bath. Solve that problem, <laughs> right? But if they say it hurts when I move, I can't say, well, don't move. That's part of your life. It hurts when I wear clothes. That's these channels that are now hyper-responsive. Something's wrong with them. They're sending too much information. Understanding their biology may open up avenues of therapy by targeting these channels, which many of which are uniquely expressed by these, paint, by these nerve fibers. And we'll explain in a moment why that's important. The last one that's important to note is a cold channel called TRIP-M8. It only responds, excuse me, to cool stimuli. Why is that important? Because in the setting of, much nerve, of many nerve injury conditions, it's a cold stimulus that is excruciatingly painful. Whoops, I actually have that in my arm. I tend to, you're lucky, I tend to move around a lot when I lecture, and years ago I fell off the stage lecturing and shattered. <laughs> Wasn't good. I shattered my elbow. I had surgery. Um, I have a crooked arm. But the thing is, I did obviously damage some nerves, and I have incredible cold sensitivity. If I'm in the car, the air conditioning's on. I have to turn it off. It's really, really unpleasant. Almost certainly, it's because this channel is being activated and driving too much information. This channel doesn't exist anywhere else in the nervous system. What that means is if the drug companies or someone could come up with a drug that will eliminate this, they might solve my problem. And the beauty of it, and this is an important take home message, we have a lot of good drugs. It's not that we don't have drugs that are good for pain, it's that they have lousy side effects. That's the case for many, many conditions. You're all familiar with this. That doesn't mean the drug is bad or the science is bad. It means that the nervous system or the body is very conservative. It uses the same channels in general over and over and over. So when you take something, it's going to act in places where you had no intention, all right? The beauty here is many of these channels are only found in the pain fibers. If that's true and we can develop a good drug, we might be able to, if you will, in the term, open up the therapeutic window, get a better effect and less adverse side effect. So that's why these are important. Now, there's another interesting aside, and this came from the work of David Julius here, a colleague of mine. It turns out, and this is you know, one of the wonders of evolution, that many of these trip channels, which is a huge family of channels now, I pointed out trip V1, which is the heat channel, responds to capsaicin. That's a plant, right? Okay, that's interesting to say, well, that's kind of fun. Well, turns out that 
pretty much all of these channels are activated by natural products. It's way, the way many of them were discovered. Menthol is the tar selective activator of the cooling channel. Big surprise, right? Menthol is cooling when you put it in your mouth or aqua velva or whatever. Uh, it's interesting. The pain people are interested in trip M8 and the aftershave people are interested in trip M8 also, but for a different reason. They're trying to come up with a better aftershave. But it's the same channel. These are interesting ones. Brassica, which is a mustard oil, a mustard seed, a mustard plant, and allium, or member of the garlic family, they target a different trip channel called trip A1. It's also an irritant receptor, and quite amazingly, it is the target for all of these stimuli. Garlic acts by binding trip A1. Mustard oil, wasabi, when you have wasabi, that's how it acts. That's why wasabi burns and is painful sometimes if you take too much of it. Air pollution, irritants, now this is not acting in your skin, but when you breathe, there are these same channels, in this case, on nerve fibers that innervate the airways. And just for the record, tear gas, the active ingredient in tear gas, works by binding A1. Someday someone's going to come up with an antagonist to A1, and that will eliminate the tear gas problem. Spray it in your eyes beforehand. But suffice it to say that it's an interesting association, and there are many more. Camphor, cinnamon, a variety of other things target these channels. And so there's been kind of coevolution. The plants have developed ways to stimulate you. Stay away from these plants. They don't want an animal eating them. They develop the target that they know is going to be painful to the animal. The animal stays away. One of the most interesting ones is trip V1. This is a bit of an aside. Um, squirrels eat your bird food, right? It's a pain in the neck. Well, if you put a little bit of hot chili pepper in the bird food, you'll never see a squirrel again. It works. The birds have a non-functional channel. They don't get any pain from biting into this. It's, there's some stuff, it literally is called, it's French, called chasse, ec, chasse écurie, squirrel away. I've tried it, it works, but you can just make it yourself, works beautifully. It's absolutely a good example of, of the biology that we work out, nature's already done it. Does that work with raccoons? <laughs> oh, it'll work with raccoons. Oh, I guarantee you raccoons will stay away from this stuff. Go for any, any m mammal has this channel, and if they find that, I can assure you. Well, my mother, years ago, used to throw camphor. Ah, isn't that interesting? It hits, she knew something that we didn't know. Keep the gophers away, she threw camphor out in the backyard. Camphor hits one of the trip channels. It's a different called trip, I think it's four, but it doesn't matter, all right? So uh, she was way ahead of her time, but I knew that. There's one other channel I want to talk about. It's actually a, 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 a voltage-gated channel. This is the one that you're all familiar with. It is a sodium channel. Now, everyone's had local anesthetics when they go to the dentist, right? They inject it, what are they doing? They're blocking sodium channels with lidocaine, xylocaine, novocaine. And what that does is it blocks conduction by blocking the major channel. These are sodium channels. Turns out now we know there are at least 10 different types of sodium channels. And what's interesting is that we're starting to find out the association of channels, their distribu distribution in different parts of the body. One of the most interesting and exciting is called 1.7. Why do I tell you about this? Because it was discovered just a few years ago that 1.7, there are some natural mutations where people, in fact, mostly children, do not have a functional 1.7. And they have no pain at all. That's not good because they die young, because they get internal injuries and never report pain. Here's an example of someone with congenital insensitivity to pain. All right, open wounds, terrible. Pain is useful. Acute pain is useful. It's a warning signal. But under normal circumstances, when you experience it, you go away. You get out of the situation. This individual, this poor boy, uh, never feels pain. You literally have to remove teeth because if you bite your nails or something, you literally will amputate your limbs. It's that terrible. But it turns out that this channel 
is probably, at least in a major, uh, large number, uh, is mediating that loss of pain sensation. It was discovered in a Pakistani seri a family, a, a pedigree of Pakistani kids, who were jumping off of uh, roofs and, and diving and cutting themselves, and so they were kind of circus acts. Someone found them, they, they, they genotyped them, and found this missing, this missing channel. What's exciting is not only that association, but this channel is only found in the afferent fibers. It's not found anywhere else in the body. So the drug companies say, if I could come up with a drug and then dose it properly, I won't eliminate pain completely, which you don't want to eliminate acute pain. I might be able to have an amazing new drug to treat pain. This is on the horizon. These drugs are going to be in clinical trials very soon. Will they work? Can they make them? really selective for this channel? That's the key question. But it's pretty exciting. So, so far really mostly what we talked about is acute pain. The nociceptors, the pain fibers, they cause acute pain, but I also told you acute pain is not a clinical problem. Post-op pain is kind of prolonged acute pain, but by and large it'll go away and pretty well you can deal with it. Not all post-op pain can be treated, but most. What we're interested in is injury-associated pain, persistent pain. So, let's deal with the problem of non-painful stimuli causing pain, allodynia, in the setting of inflammation. We're all familiar with every one of these conditions. Sunburn, arthritis, injured your ankle, you can't walk on it. This is what I mean by allodynia, non-painful stimuli hurt. And it's an amazingly, relatively simple explanation to explain where, how this comes about. It's a process that we call peripheral sensitization. Here's that same diagram again. We have the pain fiber, the nociceptor, sending information to the spinal cord. Now we're going to have injury, tissue injury. Tissue injury causes a massive amount of problems. And it leads to, the names aren't important, but well, they're in the syllabus, you break down a lot of membranes, lipids, and one of the products of that is arachidonic acid. Now, arachidonic acid is acted upon by a very famous enzyme called cyclooxygenase. You've heard of the Cox enzymes. That's what acts on, this enzyme acts on arachidonic acid to produce another set of lipid mediators called prostaglandins. And what the prostaglandins do is they act directly on the fiber that's been injured, that's been, oh, that's in, in, that's in the neighborhood of the injury, excuse me, fiber has not been injured, and it lowers its threshold. What does that mean? That instead of now responding only to pinch or high temperatures, it'll respond to lower temperatures, it'll respond to light touch, and you get allodynia. You get pain in response to a non-painful stimulus. So how do you treat this? Cox inhibitor. And the Cox inhibitors are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and the prototypic one, the classic non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, is aspirin. When you take an aspirin, what you are doing is you are blocking this enzyme. When you take ibuprofen, you are doing the same thing with a different drug. Some people tolerate one better than others. Naproxen or Aleve, the over-the-counter drug that you can get now. Basically the same, it works slightly differently, but the target is the same. It blocks that enzyme and it prevents the whole cascade. You block the sensitization and the threshold comes back up. Now I just point this out because you've heard of COX-2 inhibitors. You know the famous Vioxx story. Vioxx was a very selective COX-2. It turns out there's two COX enzymes, one and two, and it turned out that COX-2 targeted drugs are really good for this problem. Celebrex is still on the market. Vioxx is not. Not because it's not a good COX-2 inhibitor. It's because it's too good a COX-2 inhibitor. Turns out the highly selective ones have cardiac side effects. End of drug. It was a wonderful drug. Why? Because you only had to take one pill a day, which is pretty damn good, instead of four ibuprofens every four hours. And it's a great drug. That's what I mean by therapeutic window. Great drug, lousy side effect, end of drug, okay? As we all know, aspirin, if it came out today, would never be approved, right? But it's already been grandfathered in. So this is 
the way we treat, or physicians and everybody treats, the great majority of these conditions. It works in some cases, doesn't work in others. A question there? Yes. Yeah, I just missed something. Why would we not include aspirin now? Because it has, it has effects on your gut, can cause bleeding, uh, and a variety of other, it's good for the heart at very low doses. So it has very good effects, but it, what aspirin does, it's, a, it's an irreversible COX inhibitor. It acetylates the enzyme, it takes a long time for it to come back, and it has effects that uh, can actually cause bleeding uh, and probably would not be approved because of that. How about the ibuprofen? In a sense, the same, but aspirin's worse, okay? It varies in individuals. Aspirin tends to be worse in that because it, it acetylates the enzyme, producing a much longer block. That's why it's called acetosalicylic acid. Uh, these other drugs block the enzyme, but in a different way. No, nope, don't apologize. I'm wondering about Vioxx. Yep. It is the one medication that helped a friend of mine with fibromyalgia. Yep. Other people are helped with other things, but this is the one that he and his doctor found worked for him, and then they took it off the market. Yep. So, <laughs> so how do we get it back? You like can't. It's not going to happen. Because we got that. Uh, but that was when they could predict the patients who were going to have the negative reaction, and so some MS patients don't, and you could predict that, and of course you monitor them. In this case, the decision was they're going to pull it, uh, and I don't think Merck was very interested in, in having another cardiac event that would they, they could kill the company. So there's. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. There are people trying to develop a Vioxx alternative that's similar, that doesn't have the cardiac side effects. I don't know if they figured out what it is that specifically caused it. I think it was a question, the fact that this is too good a selective inhibitor. This is not as selective. There's COX-1 and COX-2. These are hit both enzymes. This hits both predominantly COX-2. This is too pure COX-2, and that's its problem, okay? Now, here's a little aside that I love, a story I love telling when I spoke to Minimed years ago. A gentleman put his hand up and said, it's probably a stupid question. I said, there's no stupid question. He said, well, look, you talked about arthritis, you have a bad elbow, and you have Cox enzyme, you want to block it, so the person takes an aspirin, an ibuprofen, and he said, how does the drug know where to go? <laughs> and I said, that's a brilliant, I tell that to all the medical students, that's absolutely brilliant. You just defined the side effect problem. The drug has no idea where to go. And it, when you give a drug by oral, orally or intramuscular in, in the vein, it just goes everywhere. That's called systemic administration. And it doesn't know that it's supposed to be going to your elbow. It'll go to your elbow, but it'll go everywhere else and generate side effects because it's blocking the enzyme everywhere. If you could increase the dose locally, you could get more here, less elsewhere. That's another way to go. And we'll talk about that. Targeting the drug is a huge improvement over systemic administration. It's not something that the pharmaceutical industry is thrilled about, although patches are used, local patches. But by and large, it's a lot easier to pop pills, to have pills. Uh, but you understand the principle. And I thought that his question was absolutely brilliant. It really defined the biggest problem we face, certainly in the pain world, is that the drug doesn't know where to go. So now, mm, OK. Um, I don't know if you're willing to stay till 11.30 or not. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> OK, because I, I, OK, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll play it by ear. No, I won't go there, I promise. No, not to worry. <laughs> um, so you can call, call ET, whomever you want. But so the question, this is an important point. What is the contribution of the large fibers? So I said that the small fibers are the ones that really generate the pain input, the acute pain. And when they're sensitized, you get allodynia and you get a clinical problem. Does that mean that the large fibers don't do anything? I said they respond to light touch. They make arms move, they respond to joint. Does that mean that these guys have nothing to do with pain? Well, the answer is no, because even though they do not respond to noxious or painful stimulation, they come into play and their activity is important. Um, it turns out that if you increase the activity of the large fibers, 
You can actually reduce pain, and you guys do it all the time. <coughs> Let's do an experiment. Walk into the kitchen, there's a hot pot on the stove, you don't realize it's hot, you pick it up, now what do you do? Act it out. You shook your hand. Why did you do that? It seems to decrease the pain. Okay, let me tell you. You just massively stimulated your hand. You activated all those unmyelinated afferents. You got pain. So what did you do? I stimulated a little bit more. But you obviously did it because it works. It's an innate, it's reflexive. But this stimulus is activating large fibers. It is a vibratory stimulus. It's like rubbing your hand. In fact, you shake your hand because you're trying to bring in large diameter fiber activity, and you do it because it works. In fact, what's happening is the small fibers send the input in, and the large fiber input has the capacity to block the output of the spinal cord, and that's why you do it. And there are many ways to do that. You can shake your hand. You can vibrate. If you buy a vibrator and rub it across a, an injured area, particularly if the pain is superficial, like an incision, you can actually block the pain. Do it, don't do it where the incision is. Do it around. It can be very, very effective. Uh, you can get a TENS unit, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. You may have heard of that. It's fancy and expensive vibration. Works to some extent. It's not perfect. But what you're doing is you're stimulating the large fibers trying to block the input coming in the small fibers. Acupuncture in some forms may be a form of large fiber stimulation. Um, we'll talk about that later. Now what happens if you lose large fibers? Now I wasn't gonna show this film. It's, it, it, it was in the lecture that I gave years ago, um, but it, uh, I think we have some time. It takes about five minutes, but it's, it's a film that I, I used to do this experiment with students in live, and then they don't let me do that anymore. So I had to put uh, someone on film to do it. It was a former student of mine who's now on the faculty here, Dana Rhodes. So let's just see what happens if you block all the large fibers. I can do it experimentally by putting a blood pressure cuff on an arm, blowing it up above systolic pressure so there's no blood, no oxygen running to the arm. The arm will be paralyzed uh, because the large fibers make the muscles move, and there you go. The large fibers require more oxygen, so you can actually block all the large fibers. So the question is, what happens under those conditions? So let's see. Now, unfortunately, the sound wasn't working perfectly. So here's the experiment. We have an arm in Dana where there are small fibers. This is a little schematic. And large fibers, I put a blood pressure cuff on that will block the large fibers. Let's see what happens. Okay, so I'm gonna bend this down and hopefully you will be able to hear. About 15 seconds, 10 seconds. Let me know if you can hear the sound. I had this blood pressure cuff in her arm. The arm is cyanotic because it's an offset. Can you move your fingers? Uh, I, I can clutch, I just can't extend Okay, you can't extend it. There, so there is, we haven't got a complete block because Dana can flex her fingers a little bit. So almost certain. There are some large fibers still functioning, but I think the point will still be made, and almost certainly there's some A-deltas that are still functioning. If we kept the block on longer, we could eliminate all the myelinated fibers and just have C-fibers, but I think, but I think the, the, the illustration will still be clear. Okay, so the first thing I want you to do is close your eyes, and we'll just do a very simple neurological test. I'm going to ask Dana to say, touch, if she feels when I touch her with this, very, with this piece of gauze. This is the, the, the normal hand? Yeah, uh, touch. 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 Okay, so there's no response to light tactile stimulation. Now let's try joint position sense, conscious joint position sense, which we know is also large fiber mediated uh, dorsal column. Okay, I want you to tell me whether the finger is bent down, straight, or up, all right? Up, up, straight, down, down, straight. Okay, pretty good. All right, let's try this. Now, 
Nothing? Don't feel it. Okay, large fiber function is gone. Now I'm going to ask a simple question. I'm going to ask Dana. I'm going to use a relatively mild uh, stimulus that would activate C fibers. I'm going to ask somebody in the audience, what, is, what, what does this feel like? C fibers are the small fibers. A pinch. A pinch, okay. All right, Dana, tell me what you feel. Yes, um, exactly. Where is it? Which well, finger? That's pretty good. So that but I just don't know where almost is. certainly suggests that there is there is, there is <laughs> some A delta function in doing fine. Uh, the A deltas will give you some localized sensation. If the A deltas were not functioning at all, there'd be no response. All right. Tell me again. What do you feel this time? Nothing. Um, well, no. I feel some, a little bit of burning pain. Yeah, I feel some burning pain on. It sort of feels like the tips of all my fingers. All, all the fingers. Okay. So there really is some poor localization, but the sensation of pinch produced burning. All right? Okay. All right? Okay. Tell me what you feel. Tell me whether you feel sharp or dull. Sharp. Dull. Sharp. Feel anything? No, just a, a little bit of sort of background burning, but nothing really. I don't feel like you look alive. Now I feel a little burning. I think, Where? I think on the top of my hand. Okay, so the pain break is also producing burning. Okay, let's try just one more thing. Okay, this is the stimulus. It's ice. Tell me what you feel. Um, burning pain. Burning pain. Okay. This is a piece of ice. All right. Dana. <laughs> so, large fibers that do not do not respond to any of those stimuli, pin prick, pinch, ice, when they are blocked. The quality of the pain produced by those stimuli is completely lost. It's all burning. Now, what did I say earlier about one of the features of neuropathic pain? You have ongoing burning pain. One of the likely causes of some of these neuropathic pain conditions is that there is a relative loss of large fibers. You shake your hand because you're bringing in large fiber functions to inhibit. When you lose them because of injury or maybe diabetes or a variety of other conditions, you get burning pain. If you take an individual with CRPS and put the blood pressure cuff on the good arm, they'll tell you, that's my pain, right? So there's no way to know what they're experiencing when they say burning, but if you put it and I've had it on, and it's not pleasant, I can assure you, but of course, it's transient and you're going to go home and the cuff will be taken off, but a patient, is, an individual is going to have that if you will, the cuff on all the time. So you get a sense of what's going on, that it does model the condition and it really tells you something remarkable about the complexity of the pain experience. It's not just a function of activity of the small fibers, of the unmyelinated fibers, it's things are going on with uh, the whole uh, system, if you will. Now, I wanna talk about some other things that introduces some of the drugs that we use, a little bit as to how some of them work, some of the drugs with which you might be familiar. Um, the, and these are what I call drugs that target another major feature contributor to chronic pain, and that is central sensitization. Instead of peripheral sensitization, where we talked about changes in the nociceptor in the pain fiber itself, we're talking about changes in the central nervous system, particularly in the spinal cord. So what's really happening here, what we're talking about is, in the case of tissue injury, so it's very clear that you have activity of the unmyelinated, the small fibers, and they send information to the spinal cord, which will be here, and then the information goes to the brain. When this persists, you get abnormal activity here, sometimes in the absence of this stimulus. So that now the nervous system has changed. It's particularly difficult and problematic in the case of nerve injury. So here's the model. Now you have some nerve injury. This could be 
what happens with a phantom limb, which is basically nerve injury, right? You lost a limb, it's been damaged, or postherpetic neuralgia or CRPS, nerve damage, and then you get changes in the cell bodies and you get huge changes in the central nervous system. This is central sensitization. And let's talk a little bit about some of the factors. There are so many that I could describe, but I want to talk about a few because they it, it, it introduce us to some of the drugs that we use. In the simplest way, what I want to talk about is here's now the afferent coming from the ceiling. It's the nerve in the arm that's coming into the spinal cord, and here's the first synapse. Here's that C fiber, the unmyelinated fiber. It's releasing neurotransmitter, mostly glutamate, and it targets this neuron, and then the information goes to the brain and you get acute pain. Now, and there's some conditions when there's injury, you get too much activity here or too much activity here. And here's how it can come about among many, many ways. Neurotransmitter is released when calcium enters into the nerve terminal. It's that simple. The more calcium you get, the more transmitter, the more output. So obviously, if you have something that increases neurotransmitter, like too much activity, you will get too much output and you get more pain. So if we could re regulate calcium, we might be able to reduce the amount of neurotransmitter coming right from, the, if you will, the pain fiber and actually be helpful. And indeed, you may have heard of Neurontin or Gabapentin. It's a major drug used for neuropathic pain. Part of its action or its action is by regulating calcium channels. It's kind of curious, no one really knows exactly how it works. There's no question that it's regulating calcium channels and probably regulating transmitter release. It's a good drug, it's not good for everybody, it has side effects, it doesn't work for everybody, but it is now, I think, the first drug of choice for neuropathic pain. Zyconotide, I bring this up only because you might have heard of it. It's a really fascinating drug. Um, it is, comes from a cone snail, now the cone snails have found out wonderful ways to kill their prey. Psst, out comes a little peptide and the fish, the little the food just stops dead. These things are so potent, they're scary. And there's a guy named Toto Oliveras who has identified hundreds and hundreds of these that these snails make. One of them eventually got into the clinic called Zyconotide or Prealt. This targets calcium channels. It's so potent it can only be used by in patients that already have an implanted pump to go and you put the drug right at the spinal cord because if you took it orally or gave it in the periphery, it would, it would so reduce your blood pressure that you wouldn't be able to stand up. So now it turns out it has a very small market. Why? Um, who knows exactly why, but it can move to the brain maybe and it can produce side effects that nobody likes and it had a kind of a, uh, a difficult uh, embarkation, if you will. But when it works, it's quite remarkable, you know, but it's kind of a yin-yang thing. It has potential uh, side effects that are no good. But again, it targets calcium channels, and when it blocks them, it's very effective. Morphine. I'll talk later about different ways morphine works, but one of the ways it works is by blocking the calcium channel, reducing transmitter release. That's on the presynaptic side. Now, if you could block the postsynaptic after the information gets through, and I'll just tell you the, what is the major, what is the major target? The holy grail for pharmaceutical industry. Unfortunately, it'll probably never be identified or developed because the side effect profile would be problematic. But when glutamate comes out, it binds the glutamate receptor and it depolarizes and you get activity and poof, you get acute pain. But it turns out there's another type of glutamate receptor on that same nerve fiber, in fact, on every nerve in the brain and spinal cord. When this gets activated, this gets turned on, and then when the glutamate binds this channel, the NMDA receptor, it produces long-term changes, like memories, if you will, in this nerve cell. Literally memories, memories of the injury, New genes are turned on as a result of activity of this receptor. New structural changes occur, and some of these are probably permanent, and probably contribute to the very prolonged pains that we have. 
So when that, that receptor gets activated, you get massive changes that are like memories, but in this case, I like to call them maladaptive memories. They're no good. Can you block it? Well, one of the compounds that is used, you may have heard of ketamine. It is an NMDA antagonist, but not great side effect profiles. And some of the other ones that are cleaner just target every neuron in the brain. You have memory problems, seizures, forget it. It's been a nightmare trying to develop the drug. But what this underscores is that there are long-term changes that result from continuous inputs, damage, and these long-term changes establish memories, changed nervous system. The nervous system of an individual with a chronic pain condition is different from the nervous system of the individual who doesn't have one. It's what I call the disease, if you will, of, say, neuropathic pain. It's a disease of the nervous system. We'll come back to that later. What does NMDA mean? It stands for N-methyl-D-aspartate. It looks a bit like glutamate, and it's a, it doesn't exist in the body. It comes from the shelf, but it is a receptor, a target that we use this compound to define its function, all right? And so it binds glutamate. It responds to glutamate, but its properties are different. And in the laboratory, we can mimic and, and get selective activation using this instead of glutamate itself. So it's just, it's a laboratory definition, but it's, it has different properties from the regular glutamate receptor. So, so that's uh, the idea is to block that and get rid of all the memories, if you will. If we could induce forgetting of that circuit, we'd have a great drug. I'm actually serious, I'm not being facetious. And if there are ways to reverse the memory establishment, we might be able to deal with the problem in a very novel way. Now, okay, so we've talked a lot about driving the pain experience, I mean, driving the, the input from the injury, but where is pain? I said it's not in the spinal cord, it's not in the periphery, it's not a stimulus. You gotta get this information to the brain. So Descartes had it, he said the information goes up and it goes to the brain, and one of the students years ago got a hold of my slides and modified and said, no brain, no pain. And they were absolutely right. Pain is a product of the brain. It is a perception. It is like beauty. There's nothing inherently beauty, beautiful in a particular painting. It is a perception, and of course there's an emotional component to it, very much like pain, all right? So, where in the brain is pain? This is a question that people have asked for centuries. Where in the brain is pain? Uh, the fact is we don't know. Uh, one of the more interesting stories came from Bertrand Russell, who was asked this. Bertrand Russell was asked many years ago um, by his dentist, you know, where does it hurt? Everybody asks you all the time. And it, he said, um, in, in my mind, of course. <laughs> wasn't quite what the dentist, wasn't gonna help the dentist, because the dentist is looking for the tooth, but of course he had it right. It's up here, you inject a local anesthetic and all of a sudden the pain went away. Um, but the pain is in the brain. What we now know is that, and imaging studies have really opened our eyes, is that there is no particular pain site in the brain that we can say that's where pain is. And if I took, tore it out or cut it out with a knife, pain would go away. Doesn't work that way. Pain, there's a matrix of activity. Because remember I said what makes up pain? A sensory discriminative component. Pain has lo location, usually. You know it's in your arm. It has modality. There's heat pain, deep pain, muscle pain, visceral pain, cold pain, all different kinds of pain. And you can distinguish those, usually. And there's obviously difference of intensities. There's mild pain, there's very severe pain. So that's a sensory aspect of pain. And of course, then, as we said, there's the emotional component of pain. People suffer with pain. These are the questions they ask. And that's what makes life miserable. That's why the quality of life with chronic pain is the serious problem. Well, it turns out that imaging has actually defined that there are regions of the brain that are more relevant to one or the other different features of pain. And so the sensory discriminative component, namely where is it, how intense is it, is predominantly located, not surprisingly, in 
the region of the cortex where the body homunculus is, where the representation of the body is. So just as your light touch will activate cells that respond to light touch in somatosensory cortex, in the body's representation, a painful stimulus in the finger will activate, the finger area, the different, different types of cells. And there's actually two regions we call somatosensory cortex one and two. The details are not that important. It could be a heat stimulus in this experimental case, it could be a mechanical stimulus or whatever. And it turns out that the emotional aspect of the pain experience has a very different location. And it's found in different parts of what we call the limbic system, which if you will can be called the emotional brain. And the, the two areas of greatest interest to the experimental scientists and also both clinical uh, imagers is an area called the anterior cingulate gyrus. I just give you the name because you'll hear about it in your reading if you follow this up because it's a real hotbed of study. As the suffering of an individual, as the emotional negativity of the stimulus increases, the activity of this region gets more and more, as does an area in the temporal lobes on the side of the brain called the insular cortex. So these regions are associated with the emotional experience and the somatosensory cortex more with the sensory experience. You can't just lesion one and get rid of pain. It doesn't work that way. There's too many places. You'd have to take out too much brain. In fact, there's an amazing uh, study that was published. In, unfortunately, some children that have chronic terrible seizures and they don't respond or you, they no longer respond to uh, sufficiently anticonvulsants, you have to take out a lot of tissue. In some cases, so severe that they literally do what's called a hemispherectomy. They remove half the brain in a kid. Now, you can do that in a kid, and it's amazing how they adapt. You couldn't do it in an adult because you're just not plastic enough. That individual still has pain on both sides of the body because you can get information to the opposite, to the, to the, the side that, that, that survives. It's an amazing result. It just illustrates the, the complexity that there's not one little area. Here, you take out half the brain. You didn't remove pain on one side. There's still pain all over the place. So the bane of pain is plainly in the brain, is what I like to tell the students. <laughs> Where? Where? And how much? To what extent? Is it the same in everybody? Well, I think you know the answer already. I told you. We all differ. One of the most interesting studies, and this all comes from imaging work, it depends on who is stimulated. So these are some images taken from two different individuals. In individual one, two, one, two. Different levels of the brain. I think you can tell there's a lot more activity here and here than here and here, here than here. So what's the difference between these individuals? These are males, these are females. Now it's an interesting thing. You get, if you will, more bang for the buck in a female. The same stimulus produces much more activity. Now, women happen to have lower pain thresholds than men. I know everyone says, that's baloney. How could they ever have babies? Uh, and I have no idea how they can ever have babies because people have actually done studies where you can put a heat stimulus and keep increasing and increasing and get it quantita quantitated. And let me tell you, the amount, then they say, how many doles or levels of pain do I have compared to when I'm in labor? Uh, and it's so high, no guy could ever tolerate it. But their thresholds are lower but they tolerate it better, which is pretty amazing. So you have to distinguish between pain threshold is the point at which it starts to hurt versus how much can you put up with, and that's where they differ. So their brain processes the information differently. There are clear gender differences. How can you know that? How can I know what? That their threshold is... Oh, it's easy. Oh, that's very easy. If I, if, if I got you up here and I had a temperature probe, and I said it, I would find that most, most people hover around 45 degrees. It's pretty constant pain threshold. Someone says, oh, I have a high pain threshold. No, you don't. Almost everybody has the pain, same pain threshold. It hovers around 45 degrees uh, centigrade for heat, but women are a little bit lower. So they'll notice it, but it won't be a problem. No, it, it'll start to hurt. They'll say the point at which it's starting to hurt, but that's not what keeps, what keeps you going is how much will you put up with before you say, that's it, I'm out of here. And the guy says, I'm out of here. Uh, the woman says it hurts it's a little bit sooner, okay? Um, it's not clinically relevant probably, but it's a fact of life. 
Psychological state. I love this picture. Um, <laughs> the, con the conditions under which you experience the pain will determine the pain you experience. It's not just the stimulus. I've walked across hot coals. I did it once. I'll never do it again. Because um, you know why? Because you sometimes burn your feet. But there are ways to do it uh, that you, know, you walk on cool moss. But some people can just sort of block it out. And they'll end up burning their feet, not even realizing it. Okay. It depends on how much attention you pay. This is so important. People put dentists have music, right? You listen to music. What are you doing? You're being distracted. What is Lamaze? It's distraction. It's anxiety relief. It's understanding the birth experience. The stimulus is pretty much the same. And this was done in a beautiful imaging study. This is a good example of a friend of mine who rock climbs. God knows why anybody would do that. But this got to be painful. But that's not what she's experiencing at this point. Here's an interesting experiment. So this is now you, an individual. It's experimental pain, say a heat stimulus. And they're imaging the brain. In response to a heat stimulus, you get a certain amount of activity. The, the individual has earphones on, OK? The earphones are playing music. And you ask them to pay attention to the heat stimulus. And that's what you get. Then you have the same heat stimulus. You say, pay attention to the music. Concentrate on the music. That's what you get. Same stimulus. The brain processes it differently. Where did it get reduced? Was it at the level of the brain? Was it lower down? I don't know for sure, but clearly the brain is processing differently. The perception is different. It depends on how much pain you expect to experience. This is extremely important in the clinic, in the way physicians should deal with patients, in patients' expectations. Here's an experiment. You're imaging the brain. This is some activity in the cortex in response to the heat stimulus, the painful heat stimulus, when the subject is told, it's going to be painfully hot, I'm sorry, but that's what we want to find out, OK? And this is the response when you're told when it's a warm stimulus. It's going to be a warm stimulus, and basically nothing happens. You get a little activity. Now you tell the subject, it's going to be painful, but you give them the warm stimulus. And it looks much more like this, OK? This is an area that is now obviously triggering what may generate a pain experience in the absence of the same stimulus. All right? So again, you must dissociate and get out of, rid of the notion that it's all about the stimulus, because it's not. That's just where it starts. This is a, I, I show you this here. It's quite an amazing series of studies from some friends of mine in Germany, heard of floor. They were imaging the brain, the husband, in this case, it was the spouse, was, uh, no, um, no, they're actually, Im yeah, they're imaging the brain of the spouse whose husband had a pain problem, severe pain problem. And the spouses, and it only works with the female, uh, had a brain pattern that looked like what her husband's pain pattern looked like. You did it the other way around if the wife, the woman, had a severe pain problem, and you imaged the guy, it was totally normal. Uh, it's kind of depressing, but um, empathy is important. Does she acknowledge the pain that she's feeling? That's a very good question, and probably not, but I, I'd have to go back. Yeah, I could find out. The name Herta Flor, F L O R. I said I don't, I, I, I don't know. I think it's very possible to get it because the activity is part of the experience. There's what generates the overt response. You need the emotions. You need the activity in the right areas. It's a matrix of activity in lots of places. And then the gestalt of that activity is, oh, it hurts. OK? Well, let me give you an example, which I, I'm not showing because I, I showed it previously, and I was really concerned that I was going to see too many familiar faces. I'm happy to see some new faces. I'm happy to meet people again. Let me tell you the story that I usually like to talk about. I won't show it because I don't have the slide. But you're familiar with Mondrian. Mondrian, if you go to the Museum of Modern Art, it's he painted, he was a Belgian painter, and he painted these beautiful paintings with stripes and bars, different colors. Okay? The kind of thing you know that you think your kid could do in, right, if they had a good ruler and good colors. 
So you go to the museum, picture this here. Now we're going to just use a little imagination because I won't show it to you. So here's this Mondrian, and you're walking into the museum, and if you're not into Mondrian and you know, you're looking for the Picasso, that's what you really want it came to see, um, you walk by this, you look at it, you don't get it at all, and you walk right by. Did your brain respond to that? Absolutely, because there are red stripes and yellow bars, and you have a visual cortex that responds to yellow bars and stripes, and you got all this activity. That's great. The next person comes in who wanted to see that Mondrian, who's actually thinking of buying and paying $27 million for that painting. <laughs> I looked at it and go, I don't get it. I'm looking for the Picasso. So this other guy comes by and oh, just stopped dead in his tracks. Oh my god. But the woman walks by in the tears. Everybody's emotionally charged by this. They understand his history. What was he trying to say? Same stimulus. The cortex is activated exactly the same way. One of them evokes an emotional reaction that's powerful. I want to buy the painting. The other one just pfft, walks right by. So the brain activity itself in response to the stimulus doesn't necessarily mean that you get the emotional component, or you may have the emotional component without the stimulus. So whether or not it produces the overt report depends on that whole gamish. So is there emotion part of the brain Yes. Also no, well, there are many areas of the brain that are related to emotions. There used to be a lot of, there's much less now, psychosurgical procedures. There were kids who were a little aggressive in class. So they burned a few areas like the amygdala just to calm them down. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Uh, this was done very commonly, you know, because, you know, this is even, even when drugs were available, but forget the drugs. Psychosurgery was done to lesion these areas to calm people down. Uh, so yes, there are many areas, but there's not one area. So what can we conclude? Uh, and this is an important take home message, particularly for the students, that, that you can't predict how a patient's going to respond or how much pain a patient has. You have to listen, look at the injury, take your experience, but then try to understand the context in which the patients, do they have cancer pain? Where do they think they're going to die? Or do they have equivalent pain, but someone told them that we're going to be able to cure you. It's very possible they'll have different amount of pain. They're going to react differently. Or you may say, that's ridiculous. How can anybody have that kind of pain with that, what looks like an, no injury? Big mistake, all right? Big mistake. They could have terrible pains. You just can't see it, all right? Doesn't mean they're making it up. I personally don't believe in psychogenic pain, pain with, that's just generated from inside. I don't believe that, although plenty of people do. So now, in the time left, I want to talk about different pain procedures. We can go through many of them. We've discussed some of them already. Now, we talked about uh, shaking your hand. This is what I call a segmental pain control. What do I mean by that? Well, if your right hand is hurting. <coughs> Hello? <coughs> oh, OK. If your right hand hurts, you don't shake your left leg, OK? Or you don't go like this in order to stop the pain in your, you shake your right hand. That's segmental. You're trying to bring in the large fiber activity in the same region so that the things converge into the spinal cord and shut things off locally. And it works. That's segmental control. It may be that there's a thing called dermatomal acupuncture where you actually stimulate in the area. You put the needles where the pain actually is. It's probably some form of this. Much more dramatic are the more systemic, if you will, fancy procedures, where you're targeting the brain in order to get a more global pain control. And there are many. And the one I want to tell you about, which is used much less for pain, although it's used for Parkinson's and a variety of other, is, uh, other uh, conditions, is to put an electrode in the brain, <laughs> stimulate, and produce pain control. And the reason why I tell you about this is that it's a good segue into explaining how opiates work. 
It's also how I cut my teeth doing science many years ago because much of the work that I did in early years was to try to figure out how this works. So basically what we're looking at, here's the spinal cord, the information comes in, goes to the brain, goes up and you get pain, but then there are descending systems coming down from the brain that can block activity at the spinal cord. And it was discovered initially in animals and then very rapidly was taken to humans that if you put an electrode in the brain, in a particular part of the brain, and we don't have time, it's not important to go to the target, well, I should, it's called the periaqueductal gray in the midbrain, the middle of the brain, okay? You stimulate here and it can block pain without blocking the animal or the human's ability to get along and do other things. The animal will be running around, light touch responds to it, it'll eat, it'll sleep, it'll do whatever, but if you pinch, it doesn't respond at all. Pretty amazing. And it was worked out over many years that the way it works is it actually turns on a powerful descending system that goes down to the spinal cord and shuts off the spinal cord so that the information never gets to the brain. Pretty cool. Now, this is an example in a human. It's done while the patient's awake. You anesthetize the skull and the scalp because that's going to cause pain if you cut. But once you stick an electrode after drilling a hole in the skull and stick an electrode in the brain, the brain doesn't feel pain. You can stick electrodes in, that's fine. So you put an electrode down to the target. Then you draw the wires underneath the skin, put it into a chest, and then the patient will press a button several times a day as necessary and they can get amazing pain relief. There are probably 5,000 people in the world who have had this procedure. It can be quite dramatic, but it's a surgical procedure, and if, if they respond to drugs well, you're not going to do this procedure. But it, but it is pretty dramatic, and it can work. But the exciting thing was the observation that if you take initially animals, it was shown in animals, and then it was shown in humans. If you take an individual that is stimulating and the pain goes away, and then you give them a drug called naloxone. The pain comes back. Anybody know what naloxone is? Naloxone is an opiate antagonist. It's a narcotic antagonist. Now, let's talk for a moment about opioid receptors. You've heard of opiates. Opioids is just a big class that is targeted, <coughs> excuse me, targeted by the endorphins. So there are, we've all heard of the endorphins. These are molecules in the brain. They're peptides. And they bind these opioid receptors and they can block pain. Naloxone blocks the receptor, interferes with the binding of the endorphins to the receptors, and it blocks this completely. Okay? Pretty straightforward. But the assumption is if naloxone blocks this system, that stimulation must release endorphins. So the idea is that when you stimulate, you release the endorphins and you initiate this pain, pain relief and naloxone is the key, naloxone reverses it. So that's pretty cool. But someone says, well, so what? But naloxone is the key to understanding this. Because remember, I said naloxone is an opiate antagonist. And what's the paradigmatic classic opiate? Morphine. So this is an endogenous opiate. It's in the brain already. Morphine and other exogenous opiates work from the outside. You inject it or you take it orally. And it binds the same opioid receptors that are bound by endorphins. And the idea then is that when you say give systemic morphine, it will bind that same area where you stimulate it, turn on the descending system, and shut off pain. In a nutshell, that's the simplest way to explain how narcotics work, all narcotics. Now, as I said, morphine and other narcotics, I'm talking oxycontin, Codeine is just methylated morphine. Heroin is dimethyl morphine. These are all variations. Okay, they don't look like the endorphins, but they act just like the endorphins. They do the same thing. Great drugs. Drug of choice for severe pain. Their problem is not that they're 
bad drugs. They're great drugs. They're effective drugs, but they have lousy side effect profiles. Why do they have side effects? They have side effects because the opiate receptor is not just in the pain pathway. The opiate receptors are all over the place. The nervous system is very conservative. A person who is an, an addict on heroin is not taking heroin in order to get pain relief. They're trying to get a high. Where do they get a high? They get a high because that same, whoops, I'll go back to that one in a second. They get a high because the morphine and heroin binds opiate receptors in the limbic system, the same parts of the brain where the emotional experience of pain occurs. They're trying to get a high, right? So the heroin addict is trying to get the morphine, I mean the heroin up here, not in the pain relieving place. One of the other terrible side effects happens to be in the medulla and, <coughs> excuse me, causes respiratory depression because there are opiate receptors in the breathing control circuits. You take too much heroin, the person comes in in the ER in a coma, three o'clock in the morning. What do they do in the ER? What's the first thing they do when that person comes in in a coma? Naloxone. You don't know whether they overdosed, but if they did, naloxone will bring them up in milliseconds. Kicks the heroin off the receptor. Whoa, what am I doing here? Okay, and naloxone by itself doesn't do anything, so that if it turns out it was some other reason, you won't do them any harm, but you might save their life. Now, the worst side effect, so yes? Is naloxone only used to offset the effects of opioids? Yes, yeah, naloxone basically has no other use. There, by and large, the answer is yes. Now, What is the major reason why people stop taking opiates, say, if they have cancer pain? Constipation. Miserable, horrible constipation. Because there are opiate receptors in your gut. And when you take an opiate for pain, you can shut off your gut because you're taking high doses, and you can literally be constipated for weeks. So that the patient says, look, I can't deal with it, I'll take the pain, because constipation is so bad, okay? There are new drugs, where well, this is a, a variation, a corollary to your question, there are drugs with naloxone that is modified so it can only get, stay in the periphery, it can't cross the blood-brain barrier. You make it hydrophilic so that it's charged, can't cross the blood-brain barrier so it can only act in the gut, and the idea is that then it can block the effect of the systemic morphine, block the gut effect without blocking the pain-relieving effects. So this is new drugs that are on the market. This makes sense. Now, how do you, all right, here, I'm gonna ask the question, done it before, I asked all the medical students, how many people have had diarrhea? <laughs> yeah, reasonable number. Medical students, zero. <laughs> I always, I always, it's amazing, two, 150 students, two kids put their hand up, all right? They're, they're embarrassed, but of course they've all, everyone's had diarrhea. So what do you do, how do you treat diarrhea? What drug do you use? Imodium. Imodium, oop, I have a picture of it. There it is, Imodium. Now if, you, if I could blow it up, but I can't, uh, it says low motil, low fentanyl. What is that? That is an opiate. It looks, it's a bit like morphine, but it's hydrophilic, it's charged, can't cross the blood-brain barrier, so in this case, the effect that you want is to shut off the gut. You want to basically get the constipation without the pain relief. That's what, that's what this is. If I were to take Imodium and stick it in your brain, it would be a pain-relieving drug. So this is a case of taking advantage and understanding the biology. It's the same receptor, exactly the same receptor, in a different circuit. And when you give systemic morphine, remember, the drug doesn't know where to go. Same problem. So targeting is what it's all about. And that's the reason why it's of interest. And one of the biggest breakthroughs that, again, came from animal work, Tony Yaksha's work in San Diego. Now it's just done every day in thousands of patients throughout the world. <clears throat> is to use epidural morphine, direct it right at the spinal cord, because it turns out there are opiate receptors here, and it is possible to pour morphine or a different drug 
at the level of the spinal cord, it goes into the spinal cord and can actually block pain very locally. Now, the advantage of that is that you don't get the side effects because the brain's way up here, the gut's out here, and you have a high dose here. Does it work? Yeah, it works fantastically. Is a woman who had a C-section a couple hours before, was given epidural morphine, she can get off the table. She can walk because morphine doesn't cause paralysis like local anesthetic would. She has no pain. She can take care of her baby. You do get side effects. You get some uh, uh, um, pruritus, some itchiness. This redness is not makeup. It's actually some redness. You, get, you, you can get that. That can be treated, interestingly, with low doses of naloxone because the idea is you block the low dose hits this without blocking the part at the cord. So this is an example of targeting the drug. This is done, thousands and thousands of patients get this every year. Some patients have pumps where they direct the drug to their spinal cord for cancer pain or prolonged pain. Can you get the right doses? Does it work? Yeah, it does work. Is industry interested? Not particularly because not a good market. All right, what other, I call, politically sensitive approaches? We, we, I hinted at it before. Uh, you might recognize this picture. I know this. Was that you? No. Oh, no, no, I didn't inhale. Remember that? No. Uh, no, of course not. Um, cannabis sativa, there's uh, the marijuana uh, plant. Uh, this is the active ingredient. And the question is, is it a good pain relieving drug? It's actually approved in Canada, not for pain, because it, as many of you, some of you may know, it does tend to stimulate appetite. Um, it's been reported uh, to stimulate appetite, and there's some conditions where people lose their appetite, and this is actually approved to stimulate appetite. The question is, what about for pain? Because a lot of people, it's also good for nausea, fabulous drug for nausea, no question about it. For pain, it's very interesting, and I'll be very honest, the data is, as far as I'm concerned, not clear. I will tell you that in animal studies, it's very effective. We know where the cannabinoid receptor is. It's different from the morphine receptor. It has a different distribution, has different side effects. There are some studies in humans that say it can be very effective, and others, I'm talking proper controlled studies for pain, that it can be very good, and others it's not so convincing. I think more studies need to be done. But there's no question that as for, for nausea and other conditions, fabulous drug. Does it have side effects? Of course it has side effects. It's all about do the, do the, do the, do the effects outweigh the side effects. Yes, sir? That's an, you know, that's a very uh, interesting choice of words, but that's exactly the thing that people talk about when they've had literally frontal lobotomies. They say, I have pain, but I don't care. It doesn't hurt. That's not quite what's going on here, because um, if you give enough, you might get to that state. But we know that there are cannabinoid receptors where the marijuana is binding at the level of the spinal cord, not even in the brain. So you could, you could get the drug to the spinal cord block pain without even getting to the brain. So again, it's a question of what effect and what side effect can you tolerate. But indeed, if you can get rid of the, if you can have the I don't care, there's a term that's been used, la belle indifférence, the beautiful indifference. Um, so I don't think that's a great condition to be in because you want to be able to adapt normally to conditions where you, because you might end up not caring about anything and that's not a good thing. How will analysis be totally brownies? Is the oral medication that you can take, which is uh, from cannabinoid? Yes, it's Marinol. Absolutely, it's available, you can get it. It, it is basically a purified form. Um, and you can get it, it's not approved for pain, but it can be used for that, but the, 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 the formulation is such that it's probably not the best way to deliver it. Uh, some of it, it works better by different routes. The oral route is not the best route for this. But that does exist. Now, in the few minutes left, power of psychology. If pain is in the brain, then psychology has to work. All right? And that's why you can't ignore the placebo. The fact is placebos work. They're very effective. Every time a physician gives you a drug, there's a placebo element to it. Because if you have two, you, imagine the following. You come into my office and I say, now, sir, I have this 
new drug. I, we've been trying to treat your pain, you know, for a long time, and I just don't know what to do. So some guy from industry I, I gave me this drug. Between you and me, I don't think it's going to do a damn bit of good. But I don't know what to give you, so here, take it home for a couple of weeks. Give it a try. All right, that's situation number one. Now let's try situation number two. Now, sir, wow, am I excited. We've been having problems trying to treat you. I have this new, I've been reading about this. I'm really excited about this drug. I really think it's going to be exactly what you need. Try it for a couple of weeks. <laughs> Same drug. I can assure you that the latter approach is a slightly better way to be giving drugs out to your patients. Why? Because you're introducing, the patient has to believe in the compound. If the patient doesn't believe in it, it's not going to work as well. For sure. Yes, sir. And then, of course, there's always the ethical issue. Excuse me? Of course, then there's always the ethical issue. Oh, yes. Just a Eth ethical issue aside, you, you do not treat just with placebos. So you wouldn't do that, but any time I give you a drug, I have to try to tell you that I have confidence. I think this is going to help. I would never tell you, I, you know, I really don't think it's going to work, even though there might be a few studies that say it does. So placebos work. Uh, and the most e remarkable thing, originally descri described here at UCSF by Howard Fields and John Levine, placebos are not working out somewhere out there. They're working in your brain, and they're modifying chemicals. It's just a psychological route to modifying chemicals, and it turns out that naloxone will block the effect of placebo. The data is very clear. It's been substantiated. What does that mean? That just means that endorphins are released in the setting of the placebo. It's not fancy. It just means that endorphins are released by a psychological state that they can then turn on the control system. The data is very convincing. It's very impressive. Now, so what's the significance of that? And this is where I segue into my personal beliefs about acupuncture. Now, acupuncture works for some people. No question about that. No question about that. I'm interested in mechanism. So then the question I ask is, how does acupuncture work? My personal feeling? is that it's a placebo, okay? Now, a lot of people say, oh, here we go, you know, <laughs> doesn't believe in any of that. I, now, wait a second, because that doesn't mean acupuncture doesn't work. I'm talking, how does it work? Turns out naloxone can block the effect of acupuncture. One other important, two other important features. To my knowledge, my reading, and I can tell you that there are, yes, published papers that show that acupuncture can be better than a placebo. Um, or what they call placebo acupuncture, which is a tough one. But acupuncture doesn't work for pain in children. Now, yes, children are sensitive to psycho psychological impact. You know, mommy hugs them and that will help. But they're not placebo responders in the way an adult is. When the white coat comes in and brings in this gigantic needle and said, I'm gonna make you better. It doesn't work with a kid. It might work with an adult. They said, no, that's bad news. So I, they're not, to me, that says something. If it were, give a kid morphine, morphine will work, all right? But acupuncture doesn't. And the other thing that I think is far more important is that, and it's very clear, that where you put the needles doesn't matter, all right? It doesn't make any difference, my reading of the literature. And that suggests to me that certainly the meridian notion is not relevant here. Yes. Does it work in children? It's not used in children for pain. No, that's a very good question. And my reading says no, it is not used in children under 10 years of age. Okay? Even in a um, social structure where yes. the go to medical procedure is acupuncture. That's right. And there's much less of that. In China in the 60s, of course, people went for acupuncture and had surgery under acupuncture, rather limited types of surgeries, because you couldn't get any kind of muscle relaxation, so it was very limited. Uh, and part of the thing is that gas anesthesia was pretty poor, and the word got out that some people didn't get out and leave the hospital, and so they chose acupuncture. The incidence of use of acupuncture in, say, China was way down for traditional, for regular medical practice. Is it still used? Absolutely. It's used in here all the time, all right? Um, I'm saying this is one person's opinion. My reading of the literature among all the studies, my interpretation is that it is a placebo. That doesn't mean it doesn't work. That's the most important message. 
Oh, this I like to show. This is <laughs> medical students again. They're, they're, they, you know, patron saint of acupuncture. You know. <laughs> saint Sebastian, I'm sorry. He's not in pain. He should be, it's a noxious stimulus. And then lastly, hypnosis. Um, and one of the most beautiful studies is done by a friend of mine in Montreal, an imager. Um, and, and this study was straightforward. You have a noxious stimulus, painful stimulus, and they're imaging the brain. And you get activity in the somatosensory cortex associated with the location of the stimulus, say on the face or the hand, as we talked about before. And then this is your famous anterior cingulate gyrus. This is the area that correlates, the activity correlates with the unpleasantness, the emotional quality of the response. It's big here. Then they took these individuals and they hypnotized them. About 80% of people can be hypnotized. All right, doesn't correlate with placebo, interestingly. They hypnotized them and so that they felt it, but it was less unpleasant. And they imaged them. And this is what they found, is that the activity in the anterior cingulate gyrus plummeted. But there was no significant difference in the uh, somatosensory cortex. What said in other words, the information got to the brain. The brain processed it, but you didn't get pain because you were on a selective block of the emotional component. So they knew it was there, it just didn't hurt as much. So it's, it illustrates the power of hypnosis. It's way underutilized probably because there aren't enough people who know how to do it, but I'm a big believer in it. Now, in the last oh, five minutes or so, um, I want to take like a real segue and I threw this in because I said I wanted to talk about really a little far out, but where might some of the, where might we be going? I've talked a lot about pharmacology, which I'm a big believer in. I think drugs are good if they're used properly, if they're targeted properly. I think psychology is very powerful for pain, very important. Um, but this is something very different. And what I'm calling this is a way to think about treating the disease. It's a controversial word in the pain world. Um, Pain is seen by everybody as a symptom of some other disease, cancer, arthritis, multiple sclerosis, you name it, all right? But I think, say, particularly neuropathic pain, when there's nerve damage and the nervous system is altered, that's the disease. The disease is a nervous system disease, and you need, if you want to treat that disease, you've got to change the nervous system. So that's the idea. Um, can we do that? And so we're using animal models of this condition, neuropathic pain produced by nerve injury, where you have hypersensitivity as a result of a mild nerve injury. And this can be modeled, it was developed many years ago. You can see it in, 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 from mice all the way up. So remember, what's happened is that you have a nerve injury, say in the leg, and it produces changes in the spinal cord that contribute to, if you will, the disease of neuropathic pain. The nature of that disease, we talked a little bit about it, but one of the things I didn't tell you about, one of the biggest problems is that the inhibition that normally would be operating and that you tap into by shaking your hand is reduced. Let me show you what I mean. So here's a very simplified diagram of our spinal cord. And what we're looking at, it's half a spinal cord. Here is our famous afferent fiber. It could be an unmyelinated, but there are going to be many, and we're going to talk about partial damage. So the afferent comes in, and it releases glutamate, and it targets a cell that's going to send the message to the brain, and you get pain. When you have nerve damage, one of the things that happens is that you actually lose a lot of the inhibitory control neurons in the spinal cord, these so-called GABAergic. GABA is just the, the neurotransmitter that mediates this inhibition. Now you've got a problem because any input that comes in doesn't get regulated and you get more bang for the buck. You get much more pain. You get hypersensitivity. No question that this is coming into play with nerve injury. How do you treat it? Well, one of the ways to treat this type of pain is to increase, whoops, GABA to treat it as if it's a kind of a seizure condition. And in fact, you use anticonvulsants, are the, some of the gabapentin and other drugs that are anticonvulsants that treat epilepsy. What is epilepsy? Epilepsy is a condition in which there's a loss of inhibition. 
and you have hyperactivity in the cortex, you treat it with an anticonvulsant. In many ways, that's what's happened here. You have, a, if you will, a seizing spinal cord. So you use anticonvulsants, and many of them are effective, not completely, and you reduce the pain. Isn't Neurontin? Yes. That's exactly. Neurontin is one of the drugs that is used for this. It actually, it's called gabapentin. It's not really replacing GABA. The name came from the fact that somebody misunderstood. It's a pretty interesting story. They thought they were making a GABA drug. It's not acting on GABA at all. But yes, it's an anticonvulsant. That's one of the reasons it works. <clears throat> so what about the possibility of replacing the GABAergic interneurons that are missing? Actually putting in neurons, and that's what we're trying, and it looks like it works. It's very early days, so let me tell you how we do this. This is work from a guy named John Rubenstein, who's actually an MD-PhD psychiatrist who studies brain development, and he d determined the cells of origin of all the inhibitory neurons in our cortex. In the, they start off in the embryo as precursors, and they develop into inhibitory interneurons. And he defined the area of the brain where they develop. It's called the MGE, the medial ganglionic eminence. The names aren't that important. But all of the cells that are going to become GABA interneurons in the cortex originate from here. So the question is, if you took these cells that are going to turn into GABA interneurons, could you stick them in the spinal cord and replace the cells that are missing? Sounds kind of space age. Well, I have to, I'm not going to take credit for saying we're the first to think of this because John's group had done this and ta taken these and put them into the cortex of animals that have seizure conditions and they were able to treat the seizures. And that's what gave our lab the idea. Well, epilepsy, neuropathic pain, GABA, Maybe we could take these cells, put them into the spinal cord, and treat a neuropathic pain condition. Even though we were told it's not going to work because these cells don't grow in the spinal cord, they're, they're, they're meant for the cortex, well, it turns out they're perfectly happy in the cord. Just give you a couple of examples. So here's the, here's the problem. You have your, your, here's your afferent. We have the output cells that are sending the message to the brain. And then we have all these interneurons that are normally there. Lots of inhibitory ones, some excitatory ones. And then when you have nerve damage, you lose a lot of cells. You lose inhibition, and now you have neuropathic pain, one of the big problems. So the idea is stick an electrode in filled with these precursor cells. They will develop into neurons, nerve cells, inhibitory nerve cells that populate the cord, treat the disease, not the symptom. Will it work? The answer is yes, it does work in the animal. Uh, this is an example of an animal that had a transplant. These are adults now. Remember, these are embryonic cells from an embryonic mouse brain that are isolated and then injected into the spinal cord. They're green because the mouse is a mouse in which all the cells are green that make GABA. It's just a, it's a way of following these particular cells. These are modified mice. You inject them in, here's one side of the cord, here's the side that was injected, it's pretty obvious, you can see the cells, and we're populating the part of the cord where the input's coming in. This is where the cells were lost, now we're filling them up. So they grow, they're happy, they integrate, they talk to the host, they receive inputs from the host, and more importantly, in the setting of a nerve injury model, you can completely reverse the condition. Let me just show you, so this is a nerve injury model, same as in the human, where the animal develops a hypersensitivity, just like the human. Light touch, the animal will withdraw. It's not a severe stimulus, it's a mild condition that models the human condition. So here we're talking about the threshold is set at 100%. How much intensity does it take for the animal to just withdraw the paw? It's a mouse, okay? It's an adult mouse. Now, when there's a nerve injury, within 24 hours, the threshold drops. So very light touch will now cause the withdrawal, just like in the human, hypersensitive. Is there ongoing? I have no idea. I don't know what's going on in the animal's brain. It's an important question, but there's hypersensitivity. Now we transplant and then follow the animals out. And it takes a while, but as you see it, this is the transplanted group by four weeks the animals are completely normal. 
It lasts as far as we can tell. It doesn't recover, I mean, it doesn't get any worse. Most interestingly, it doesn't affect normal thresholds at all. It only reverses the nerve damage induced condition. That's what I mean by treating the disease of pain. Will it work in the future? Where do you go with this? Well, eventually you will go to transplanting either modified stem cells that can be turned into inhibitory interneurons, something that is doable now. And it's something we're seriously thinking of doing, and I, it is, it is uh, way in the future, but it is a very different way of thinking about uh, the problem of pain. Yes, sir. No, that's what's so interesting. It, it, it can affect the hypersensitivity to these other stimuli, but baseline thresholds, if you transplant it to a normal animal, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. It do you use, uh, some other animal on humans, or do you have to use human embryos? Don't well, the idea of the, of the dream is to use what are called, and it was discovered by a faculty member here, uh, and who's, rich, who's actually in Japan, but he has a joint appointment here, uh, who developed a way to turn cells into stem cells, so you don't have to use stem cells. That's the, the dream, and it is possible to take what are called IPS cells uh, and uh, have them become these nerve cells. That's the approach that we would love to follow, okay? Now, so just to summarize, I told you there's lots of ways to cause pain, lots of ways for pain to become chronic, uh, and there's lots of ways to treat it. Just to summarize that, Let's talk about them. Topical local anesthetic. Well, if you can block the activity and you can put a patch on or your dentist sticks a sodium channel blocker, that works. You could do a nerve block. Your dentist does it all the time. A lot of anesthesiologists block nerves for chronic pain conditions. Uh, you might use TENS or shake your hand or buy a vibrator or get a TENS unit um, and you're activating large fibers and you're trying to bring in local inhibition. You might use Opioids, you might use cannabinoids. They act in the brain, they act in the spinal cord, they have lots of side effects, but they do work and you can't ignore them. The gabapentinoids, we talked about those. Those are very effective for some patients in some conditions. Maybe long time from now, transplants. But I will end by saying, let's not forget the brain. Because that's where pain is. And I want to show you a, a slide. Now, one of the nice things about being editor-in-chief of this journal is it's a lot of work, but you get to pick the covers of the journal. And this is one of the most dramatic and one of the ones I find so interesting. This is a, it was an article in the, in the journal published uh, last year. Um, it's a painting, obviously, by a woman who had a stroke, cerebral stroke. And she was seen in, by a neurologist for severe pain, neuropathic pain in the central nervous system, called central pain. But what she found, she was an artist, is that her pain was exacerbated dramatically when she painted with cool colors. She said this was the hardest painting, but she wanted to finish it. She was so stubborn. She said it felt like her painting arm was in the freezer the whole time, burning, ice cold, if she painted it with a blue back, with a red background, she had no pain. I think this illustrates that pain is not here. Pain is a very complex perception and that you must remember that. There are different ways to treat it from the top to the bottom. And with that, I will read you a poem that I wrote for the medical students many years ago. I modified a little bit for today because there was a little bit too much too much anatomy for the students. So this is called Praise the Lord for the Spinal Cord. I work on the spinal cord. From the periphery to the brain, there are many ascending tracts. But it's at synapses in gray matter in the spinal cord where interesting neuropeptides interact. Tissue and nerve injury inputs enter the dorsal horn, and through neurochemical magic, these inputs are transformed. Now these are details. Lamina one is quite marginal, that's the first layer, and to, all can agree, and together with lamina two, as we go down the dorsal horn, contain the neurotransmitter substance P, and keflin, dynorphin, and CGRP, I don't have time to tell you about them, providing continuous employment for a neuroanatomist like me. <laughs> as we penetrate the dorsal horn, we enter lamina three, four, and five. From here, many ascending pathways derive. 
transmitting injury messages from the core to the brain where they may or may not be experienced as pain. You see, there are no pure pain pathways that access the brain, which is perhaps why ablative surgery for pains on the wane, but since analgesic drug action, peptide, neuropeptide circuits explain, exploit cytochemistry in the treatment of pain. I am a believer in drugs. For there are few in this audience who could readily afford to relinquish the functions performed by the cord. Sure, the brain is important, but the spinal cord central. So come blow your horns, be they dorsal or ventral. <laughs> and let us end by rephrasing the words of the Lord, honor thy mother, and don't cut the cord. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So Elevil is actually one of the first antidepressants. It's amitriptyline. It uh, was discovered way back. So it is an antidepressant. It's a mixed antidepressant, kind of dirty drug. Um, it blocks the reuptake of serotonin, of norepinephrine, and also acetylcholine. And the reason why a lot of patients don't like it, because it is a good drug, it's a good, reasonably good antidepressants, but it's been replaced by much better ones, is the anticholinergic effect it gives them dry mouth. But it was shown in the 70s that it can be effective in good trials for, neuro, for the neuropathic pain of post neuralgia and diabetic neuropathy. Interestingly, at doses that are not antidepressant, and in fact, as many of you may know, antidepressants, when they work for depression, they take a few weeks to kick in. If it works for this pain, it'll work very quickly. So it's doing something different. And one possibility is that it is increasing the level of the neurotransmitters that the descending control systems use, because they are serotonergic and noradrenergic. So that's how that drug probably works. Now, interestingly, when the SSRIs, like fluoxetine, uh, Prozac came out. Everyone said, wow, this is a nice clean drug. That's going to be great for neuropathic pain. Doesn't work at all. Great as an antidepressant, does not work. The ones that are mixed in nor norepinephrine, noradrenaline, and serotonin, such as duloxetine or Cymbalta, those are effective. So it seems you need the mix of the two. And they are effective for some patients, quite effective in neuropathic pain. It's been approved for fibromyalgia <clears throat> and even for nonspecific pain, which is quite remarkable. Um, Elevil still works, but a lot of patients can't stand the dry mouth, so they much prefer to the, the newer drugs. Okay? Yes, sir? No. No, it's quite different. The nociceptive pains are the ones that are, they, they're very responsive to morphine and opiates. They're the ones that respond to the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. There's a prostaglandin link, cyclooxygenase. Neuropathic pain, they don't respond to those drugs. Minimally to opiates, not at all to the NSAIDs. Gabapentin, by contrast, the calcium channel blockers, that the gabapentinoids, morphine is, is, does act that as, as that as well. But the gabapentinoids are good for neuropathic pain. They don't work on the other types of pain. So back pain is a tough one, because uh, it it's probably mixed. But gabapentin wouldn't do much for back pain, all right? But steroids, which are like super duper non-steroidals, they, they work at a higher level, but they're really targeting the same kind of things. They're, you inject them in, they're anti-inflammatory, they're effective. So these are very different mechanistically. Now, the output cell might be the same, but the circuit to get to the output cell that drives the pain is quite different. Yes, sir? Ah, itch. <clears throat> My new favorite topic, <laughs> itch is a small pain. Um, itch and pain, it used to be thought of as a small pain. I would think if you have a lot, a lot, a lot of itch, it gets worse, 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 now you have pain. And it was the same circuit? No, couldn't be farther from the truth. It's quite clear that there are very different circuits for itch and pain. Itch is a huge problem clinically that people are starting to appreciate. Everyone thought, ah, oh, no big deal, give them an antihistamine. Many antihistamine insensitive itch problems. And here's the, the remarkable story, and it's being worked out quite beautifully by labs throughout the world now. Morphine, what does morphine do to pain? Blocks pain. What does morphine do to itch? Causes itch, okay? How do you treat itch? You scratch it. Pain blocks itch. Morphine blocks pain, itch goes up. 
And so there's a yin and yang thing. They're very different systems. The drugs are different. And we're really getting a handle now on the circuits. Quite different problems, fascinating problems, but very, very different. Yeah.